This is a monument that was built in the Soviet regime. The Soviets were great at building monumental structures of various kinds. Uh, this monument is intended to honor a man named Kurchatov, who is the father of the Soviet atomic bomb. And in the background, we have a huge representation of an atom just at the moment of being split. And those semicircles, those concentric semicircles, symbolize the energy that's released when the atom is split. Uh, and of course, when trillions of atoms are split all at once, you have an atomic bomb. That's the secret of, of an atomic explosion. But you'll notice that there are also two small hemispheres. Those two small hemispheres are the broken pieces of the uranium atom. And they are called fission products. And that's what really constitutes the radioactive fallout from an atomic bomb. It's these fission products. And that's also what constitutes the radioactive waste from a nuclear reactor. It's primarily those fission products. Now, every time a uranium atom splits, it's, it can split in many, many different ways. And as a result, you get literally hundreds of different types of fission products. And they have all different names, like cesium-137, or krypton-85, or iodine-131, or strontium-90. You may have heard some of these things. What are they? They're really broken pieces of uranium atoms. And they're very radioactive. They're much more radioactive than the uranium itself. Uh, uranium itself has a relatively non-penetrating form of radiation, as I will explain later. But these things are really um, excessively radioactive and very dangerous, even at a distance. Now, uh, here we have a gentleman. Uh, his name is John Hopkins, no relation to the university. And he's a weapons designer. That's his job, and he loves it. And when Bob uh, interviewed him, and my friend Bob, the photographer, and asked him if he could take his picture, he said, well, why don't we take a picture over here beside these pictures from the good old days when we were allowed to do atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons? And he explained that the testing of nuclear weapons is so fascinating. There's so much to learn. He said, I, they will never stop testing nuclear weapons because there's so much to be learned. And every time we do a test, we learn more. And so he was quite enamored of this, and he thought the pictures were quite pretty. Um, of course, those pictures also illustrate the main r way in which the radioactive fission products are disseminated into the environment. Uh, because they go up in the cloud and they come down as radioactive fallout, some of them goes very, very high into the stratosphere, spreads out over the entire world, and even to this day is still coming down from the days of atmospheric testing, although there's a lot less now than there was before. It's gradually being removed from the upper atmosphere. Um, of course, if we have a nuclear war, that's different. Now, the important thing to bear in mind, however, is that when we talk about radiation, don't think about invisible rays. Think about material particles, because that's what, they, what we're really talking about is not radiation, but radioactivity. We're talking about radioactive materials. And each radioactive material has its own particular chemical and biological properties. So it follows its own pathway through the environment, through the human body, through the food chain, and so on. And when it's inside the body, that's when it delivers, maybe, uh, or wherever it may be, it delivers its energy. The energy is delivered by the disintegration of the atoms. And when an atom disintegrates, it gives off a burst of energy, which can be very damaging to living cells. It can also be damaging to non-living things as well. But uh, that's what atomic radiation is all about. Now, there are many different kinds of these substances. For example, iodine-131. Now, radioactive iodine behaves just like normal non-radioactive iodine. And where do we have iodine in our daily lives? Well, for one thing, table salt, right? You iodize salt. You salt, put salt on your food, you've got iodine there. That's one of our few examples of preventative medicine, because the iodine goes to the thyroid gland, and it helps to prevent goiter, which is a disease of the thyroid. Well, not radioactive iodine behaves the same way. It goes to the thyroid gland as well. And it also prevents goiter, but it causes a lot of other problems because it's radioactive. So the, inside the thyroid gland, these atoms disintegrate, damage the cells, and especially for, for young children, it's bad news because the thyroid is important for the development of the body and the mind. And it can cause mental retardation, it can cause stunted growth, it can cause a lot of different developmental abnormalities in young children, and of course it can also cause thyroid cancer as well. 
So uh, that's basically what we're talking about. Uh, if we talk about another type of substance, cesium-137, now cesium-137 is a radioactive material which is a gamma emitter, that's a uh, uh, sort of like a very powerful x-ray, but it behaves very much like potassium. So when you, it's in your diet, the body puts it into the muscle tissues and into the soft tissues, and that's why, for example, after the Chernobyl accident, a lot of the food, the meat of animals, uh, many of you may not realize that if you go on the internet, you can check this out, that even to this day, there are farms, numerous farms in northern England and in northern Wales which cannot sell their meat for human consumption because of contamination with cesium from the Chernobyl accident 20 years ago. Because cesium has a 30-year half-life, which means that in 30 years, half of the atoms will have disintegrated, but you still got half of it left. And after another 30 years, half of those will disintegrate, but you still have half of those left. And so it takes about 300 years before you get rid of it completely. It won't take that long before they get rid of enough of the cesium to make this food edible for humans, but nevertheless, a long time. So um, here we have another example. It's strontium-90. That behaves like calcium. When the body gets strontium-90 in the diet, it, it, it stores it up to the same place calcium goes, which is in the bones, the teeth, and mother's milk. And uh, that's where calcium goes, and that's where it gets transmitted. And uh, so that's another problem. That's also about 28 years half-life. Uh, so we're talking about another 300 years there. Uh, so here's a man. Oh, and by the way, these damages, the damage that's done by radiation, is not necessarily experienced right away. In fact, only if you have a very large dose of radiation do you have what's called immediate effects. Um, but if you have a, a small dose of radiation, the effects are what are called delayed effects. And it turns out that the damage is done at the cellular level, and therefore it's invisible. Uh, medical examination will not reveal that you've suffered this damage. But uh, those cells which are damaged may develop into abnormal cells many years later. They're, they could be precancerous cells. Oftentimes, for some types of cancer, uh, they, they have what they call a latency period. And that latency period can be typically, for uranium miners, for example, it's a latency period of about 20 years. Um, I, I'd like you to think about a, a, an analogy here. It's like cigarette smoking, because when I was a kid, everybody smoked cigarettes. A lot of people smoked cigarettes, and nobody thought anything of it. All the glamorous movie stars smoked cigarettes. And people thought it was safe because they didn't notice anybody falling over dead from smoking a cigarette. It's only when you do lengthy follow-up studies that you realize what the death toll really is from these, uh, from these kind of bodily insults. And it turns out that cigarette smoking, we now know, uh, if, uh, if we were still smoking the way we were back then, uh, we'd be having in the United States, for example, something like 156,000 deaths per year from cigarette smoking. So gradually they're, they're sort of uh, uh, trying to phase out as much as possible of that. Well, the same kind of thing happens with radiation. People don't get sick immediately. They get sick eventually. This gentleman was one of thousands of armed service personnel who was ordered to go down and witness atomic bomb tests. You might not be aware of it, but there were also thousands of Canadian soldiers who went down to the Southwest Desert and down to the Bikini Islands to witness atomic tests. And he remembers after one of these blasts, he was a sailor, and he remembers being dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, and he was swabbing down the deck after the bomb exploded and, the, and the, everything had passed overhead. And he noticed at the other end of the boat two men dressed in moon suits who were sweeping the deck with some kind of measuring device. And he thought, that's awfully strange. Why are they dressed like that and I'm dressed like this? And uh, he found out years later that he had been seriously damaged. He didn't know it at the time. After, a couple of weeks after this picture was taken, he was dead. Uh, both the legs have been amputated. You can't see that there. But uh, this was damage caused many years later, by, probably by that one episode. Uh, of exposure to radioactive materials. Uh, 